Hey everyone, um, my name's Glenn. Uh, I'll start with the obligatory introductions and a bit of an apology. Um, there's meant to be two of us on stage. Um, this is really Stefan's talk. It's a talk of Stefan's journey. Um, unfortunately, there was a bit of a medical incident earlier and Stefan's now um, recovering in his room. Um, but as this... I, I didn't want to be the sort of manager that came on stage and claimed credit for one of my team's work. I also didn't want to be the manager that came on stage and presented somebody else's slide deck, but unfortunately that's what you've got. So if it feels a little disjointed, keep in mind that, um, that yeah, this is, a lot of this is new to me as well. So, um, Stefan and I work for a company called Flutter, who you probably haven't heard of. We work for a division of Flutter, known in the industry as Skybet, who you may have heard of. Um, between the two of us, we're responsible for application security, vulnerability management, that sort of thing. Um, jokingly got described on a slide that accidentally went far wide the other the day that our responsibility is to stop things that was all we use getting popped um, you know, it's all preventative security so a little bit about the company and this is relevant this isn't, this isn't a pitch about what we do it, it we, this helps to understand some of the things later on um, whilst we're a gambling company we are a tech first company a very very tech heavy company um, exceptionally agile, we're designed to move at speed, we're designed to move quickly, um, very big on innovation. We are very, very keen to let people experiment, learn from experiments, move on quickly. The whole idea, um, we, 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 sorry, we, we have an approach to mistakes of always ask how, not who. We encourage people to go and make mistakes, learn from it, do it better the next time. Um, which, from a security point of view, is really interesting because trying to be yeah, trying to do security and keep ahead of your development teams when your development teams are given that much freedom and that much scope is really quite hard. So, a little bit of um, history on where we came from, just because it, again, this does become relevant as we go through the story. When Stefan and I first sort of got, um, came together, probably four or five years ago, um, our security team in the company was very small. Um, we were a gambling company, but it was compliance first. One of our former CTOs said something that haunts me to this day because um, he's not wrong. He, he always said that compliance is more important than security because we might survive a breach. We won't survive the ability to take credit cards. As a security person, that really upset me. But on the other hand, he's probably right. So at this point, we were very much compliant first. That, that, that was the whole aim of security was to make sure we got through compliance stuff. Um, we were very isolated. We were a little subdivision of the infra team. We were off in our corner of the office. We, um, we, we wrote what we what were jokingly called sacred texts. We put out things on, you must use this encryption. You must do, build this thing this way. You must, you know, vulnerability management, vulnerability management must be done this way. We wrote these big tomes of data that we'd give out to the rest of the building and go, there you go, do that. We're security. Go get, go get that done. And we'd just throw it out to them. And as you can imagine, that didn't particularly fly very well. It went about as well as you'd expected. Development teams, they're, you know, they're empowered to go as fast as they can. Security go, here's a bunch of things that will slow you down. You just go, yeah, no. And just carry on with their, um, with, with their own thing. Um, however, our, the, the ace in our back pocket was, you know, if we really need something to do, we'd go, ah, but compliance. We'd find some bullshit reason to wrap it up as a compliance requirement, and we'd get stuff done. Um... It led to some really odd and interesting things. We'd get new software engineers in the company that go, don't really seem to do very much security. It's like, serious? You know, we spend our entire lives doing it. On the other hand, we were very ops focused, so the ops team felt that all they were ever doing was responding to things from security. It was very sort of incident driven. It was very um, operationally focused. Um, so we started, to, you know, as the company grew and the security grew, we started to try and look to do things properly. Um, we got a new role in the company, a role that Stefan, a bit louder, a role that Stefan and I did ourselves for a while, where we sat between security and the development and testing teams, worked with them to help them understand security better. We um, we got a new CTO who, in turn, brought in a CISO, and suddenly we had board representation. So the company as a whole started to get security a lot more. We start to do a lot more work with risk management because ultimately uh, a hill I'll die on is that all security is really just risk management in different terms. Ultimately, all security is just managing risk one way or another. 
Um, and we started to work with the operations communities to actually help them understand what we do a lot more. So it, it's, it started to improve somewhat, but we became victims of our own success where all these different teams all sort of came in. So our, our team of these frontline BSOs started to help. And they were doing all kinds of things. They were doing security, doing security testing. They were doing risk management. They were doing, you know, they were working in these communities, doing third party management. And they just couldn't keep up. It's suddenly a case of, hey, we're doing security better. And this just doesn't scale. We can't hire hundreds of people to, you know, to work with, with this. So we did what every other, what, you know, what everybody in the situation does. Like, Actually, how can we palm this work over there? Well, how, how can we make this their problem? And the traditional way to do that is go, ooh, we're an agile company. DevSecOps, right? Dev teams, it's your problem. We'll run away from it. You're empowered to do security. We'll get the hell out of here. If you get it wrong, that's your fault. Going back to our um, ask how not who culture when it comes to, to problem retros, that didn't really work. We couldn't just throw it over the wall. So um, this is where Stefan, who should now take over, this is where the, it's all going to go horribly wrong because this is his bit of the talk. Um, this is where he started to, um, to lead our AppSec team and set off down a very long journey to actually build a, an AppSec program. His background, we'd, he'd started at the company as a full stack developer. We'd hoiked him out of his lovely cushy dev environment and put him into security because he thought like a security person. He, um, he, he kind of got it. It's like, oh, developer that gets it, we'll, we'll, we'll have him. So we kind of pushed him backwards and gone, right, you, you've been on that side that, over there, that side that doesn't like us, that side that doesn't want to play nice with us. You've been one of them. Let's go, go, go talk to them. So, he took an entire new attitude on it. He said, we're a tech company. And this was like a big thing in our say now. You know, ultimately, we are a company of engineers. Um, you know, we're, we're not a gambling company. We, we really are a tech company. We're going to push best practices. We're not just going to write these massive tones of you should do this, you should do you can TLS 1.2, all the things. We're going to actually sit and explain how some of this stuff. We're going to actually embed security, excuse me, security as a support service. So we're actually going to help you understand this. Um, we're going to help, we want to work with the teams, we're going to take our, our text that we used to throw out about what you should do, and we're going to um, work, with you, yeah, work with the active developers to mould what should be in them. And more importantly, we're going to take one of the big lessons from Agile. We're not just going to go, oh, AppSec is a six-month project, we're going to go, we're going to buy some tools, we're going to stick them all in your build pipelines, and we're going to produce some reports and go, either that's great, you can really see it, and that's crap, and it's not. We're going to actually build a, a continuous improvement thing that's, that will go on indefinitely. And again, we, we grew to a department in our own right with um, with Buds, but this I was just joking with the Jenny outside. This is where it all goes horribly wrong because this really is all Stefan. Apparently, this is some famous AppSec model thing. It's got a name and everything that I didn't bother looking up and it isn't on my notes here. Um, but ultimately, what we worked out is that we, we had the strategy piece, we, we got our new LT representation, we had the team doing the design reviews and the implementation reviews, stuff like that. Security testing, that was where we should start. That's actually what we needed to do. We'd already been in charge of pen testing for a while. AppSec's just another, uh, another level of that. So we kind of worked out, it's like, okay, if we're going to shift left with all our security testing, we're going to give these guys this, what do we do? We, we, we do what I mean, Stefan, always at the start of these projects, we started with a whiteboard. And, you know, that's the obvious meme, but we actually did genuinely have a whiteboard session. Um, and we were very much ahead of our time. We, we, we found this, we just chucked it in because we, we, we came across it while we were trying to put the talk together. You'll notice, oops, come back. Our cause is there. That's kind of just a condensed list of the OS top 10. And bear in mind, this is three years ago. Software supply chain, long before SolarWinds. We were ahead of the curve on that one. We saw that one coming. But we kind of worked out, we went through all the different types of software testing from simple vulnerability scanning to pen tests to reconnaissance tests to um, build reviews and that sort of thing and worked out what, what type of problems they actually really addressed um, with a view to seeing how much of this we could shift left. Um, trying to remember what this was all about. So we, we ended up with our two teams. We've got our tech team over there that weren't very security focused and our infosec team there that, with the exception of Stefan, weren't very development focused. We wanted to do AppSec. They wanted to do DevSecOps. So we had to come up with this center ground of something that fit both of us. 
Um, one of the first things we did was actually go and learn how they worked and realize that in our heads, we just have to work with the developers. Developers write code? Makes sense, doesn't it? We, we teach developers how not to write crap code. Maybe work with the testers, tell them how to test for crap code. But we soon realized, actually, there's a lot more in this. The product team that actually work out what goes into the products, the op team, ops teams that support it afterwards, the delivery teams that actually work out how to get stuff to live, support teams that look after it, we have to actually build a program that fits all of these people that actually works for all. And there's a bit of an eye-opener for us, because up until this time, you know, our attitude really was just write better code. Um, so Steph did his bit with them. We spent a lot of time embedded with them. We tried to work out where the common grounds was, you know, what we cared about, what they cared about, and a few really interesting findings. Um, their engineering manager was like, our main aim here is to write quality software. We don't give a stuff about security. Security is a speed hump. Security is something that gets in our way of delivery. What we actually care about is code quality. We care about writing quality code. So we care about quality, and if it's insecure it's not it's it's poor quality so um we kind of like canvas on, on what they actually care about and it's like oh we need to build things that are supporting business needs we you know we need to ensure the highest level of quality we need to ensure business continuity and, and an industry like ours where any second of downtime is huge amounts of lost money continuity is everything so um we looked at it and thought you know what that isn't too different to what we actually care about quality Security, that's the same thing. And it, it suddenly, we realize we, we, we can repackage this. So, on our journey on this, um, can I actually read those slides? Um, yeah, so, sorry, we, we, we took that, um, that idea. So, okay, we're not going to teach you how to do security. We're going to help you write, write better quality code. Suddenly, developers on board. It's like, hang on, you want to help us? You want to buy tooling? You want to buy stuff to let us write better quality code to improve the quality of our stuff? All up for that. So it's like, hey, job done there. We then started working with the testers and the testers were saying things that was like, yeah, you know, testing is great, but we, we do feel that we, we get ignored when we bring up issues. And security was saying, you know what, so do we sometimes. You know, we feel that we're not very connected. Uh, so we, we kind of got talking as to like, you know, why, why is nobody really working with each other? You know, wh wh why do you guys not care about security? Why can't we land security with you? And it turns out the answer is it's scary. And there have been some really, really good B-sides talks on this recently. And it's something I feel really passionate about. But we as an industry are really bad or really effective. Well, it's a terrible thing we do. Uh, bullshit gatekeeping of making our industry sound really hard really complicated. Pen testing is this amazing mythical skill that only a small percentage of people can do. Infosec is really hard that, you know, you, you need, to, if, if you haven't gone through all the right levels to get there, you, you know, you, you, you can't be deemed to be part of our ministry. It's absolute bull. What we do isn't really that complicated and we've proved this because we've gone down this road We've tried to, as much, oops, tried to remove as much as we can all the scary elements and got the testers. You want to learn how to security test? You want to learn how to do basic pen testing? Great. We'll teach you that. And it's amazing how quickly that all came together. So um, we started out with a little bit of a mission statement. Security testing is gaining the confidence required that the impact and likelihood of an unwelcome outcome um, happening is within our risk appetite. And you know what the testers said? Yeah. So that's literally that. That's that's what we're doing in security. Uh, that's what we're doing in software testing. It's literally giving, giving that level of compliance. It's not black and white. It's not getting everything perfect. It's about fitting in with that risk appetite. So, oh, we're on we're on to a a good thing here. And they realise that it's like, oh, actually, we're already doing bits of security testing. It's like, yeah, you are. It's like, can we do more? It's like, you absolutely can. So we went down this whole path of changing language. We stopped talking about pen testing. Pen testing when talking to devs and uh, product teams and develop and um, testing and like that became a taboo word. We don't talk about pen testing unless we're actually engaging a third party on site. I can go, he's a pen tester. I can't talk about, oh, we're going to do that project and do a pen test at the end of it. Nah, it's all, it's all now security testing or software testing. Similarly, we stopped talking about secure coding. Secure coding was, it was a compliance requirement. It was some bullshit learning module that developers had to do that um, 
you know, taught them about buffer overflows in when they're using languages where that's, you know, with managed memory. It was just nonsense. So I said, okay, no more secure coding. We talked about Cocoid. And suddenly we got people on board. Suddenly developers and testers started to get it. It's like, oh, this is really useful and really interesting and really good and not all that hard. And ultimately, you're improving our quality. We love improving our quality. It's like, oddly enough, when it gives us more secure software, so do we. Um, we also st took a big thing of being an enabler. Another thing that we do really badly in this industry form is we put ourselves front and center as security police. It's like, you did a thing, that's bad, stop it there. You know, it's like, you, your code isn't good enough, get it there. Our vulnerability scan scanner said that you're not patching that, go patch it. We're, we're dreadful at, or again, really efficient in a bad way, at stopping, at blocking, at slowing people's down. So we said, right, we're not doing that. We're going to think more the way that the rest of our company works. We're going to be a support function. We're going to be an enabler. So it's like, okay, what do you guys want to, uh, guys, girls, want to write to, what, what do you want to write most, um, um, you know, higher quality code? You want, yeah, we want tooling that you've got loads of great tooling. So great, we'll find some tooling. So even that, we took a very different approach. In the past, we'd gone off security, looked at a whole bunch of tools. We'd even talked about budget for some of the big name um, SAS and DAS tools out there, the you know, um, source control, things like that. We've got our own minds, we've got our own favorites, but we went and sat down with them and went, okay, We'll work together on this. Security will do all the bits you don't like. We'll, well, first of all, we'll pay for it, which is the bit they really don't like. But we'll do all the dealing with vendors. We'll do all the, you know, the paperwork, the recording of decisions. We'll help you with the research. We'll give you SME support. When you're saying, oh, Glenn, you know, these two things both claim to do this bit of security. And we'll go, well, that does it this way. And we like that. And that does it. This way. We'll, we'll do that. Shit. <laughs> Try and keep my hands in my pocket. Um, <laughs> Um, we'll provide that level of SME support, but ultimately, this is your tool. You're going to choose it. You're, you're going to be the leaders of what to get for that tooling. And then, as a team, we, we kind of all work, a mixture of us and the developers, the testers, product managers. Between us, we set the requirement, we test those scenarios, we discuss the results, and we went through, and we, we did a whole shootout of a whole different um, bunch of um, tools, trying to meet, you know, some base things you've got on the screen there, but towards the, there were much and much. We felt there were good ones, we felt there were bad ones. The results were really, really interesting. We'd got a firm favourite. It was one of the more expensive ones. The dev team comes back and goes, you great? Yeah. Feature-wise, that, that is by far the best thing, but we want this one. It's like, but well, that's much cheaper. That, you know, what, then it doesn't do half the things. Why? One of their requirements that they put to try and judge a good product was could a first year junior who had never heard of concepts like SCA figure out the tool and give a tech demo to tech leadership the next day. They wanted something they could pick up and play with. They hadn't got the time or the resource to learn complicated tooling. They wanted something that they could just plug in and go, yeah, this, that, that said, go and look at that bad code smell over there or that, you know, this stuff over there. They ended up coming out with two of the sort of better value for one of the better terms. I won't say cheap because they're both amazing products, but they ended up going for SNCC and Sonicube, not because they were what security wanted. They, they weren't. I mean, don't get me wrong, I've become a huge fan of SNCC, uh, of, 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 sorry, Sneak, not SNCC. Since then, um, Sonicube, it, 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 you know, it, it does what it does. It's already quite common amongst developers. But it, it was really interesting, the fact that they didn't choose the same tools as security. And we looked at it and went, if that's what you want, great. You know, ultimately, we still get better code out of it. This is your thing. We're teaching you to write more secure code. If this gives us that, we're not going to force a tool on you you don't want. So we rolled it out. We made the mistake of letting security have the first cut at that. Security, because we're not a development tribe, because we're not a product tribe like that. We kind of did it in a very waterfall way. We just pushed it out to them. They went, yeah, we might get a chance to look at this at some point in the future. And it kind of went nowhere fast. Then again, Stephanie and his infinite wisdom went, hang on, we're doing this all wrong. We're, these are tribes designed to actually um, build things like this. Let's go talk to them. And they they took it on and went, oh, actually, we'll just do it as you know, part of our normal agile thing. We'll, we'll break it down. We'll do it in little chunks. We'll build it into our sprints. They took the entire lead. We bought this tool. They pretty much, oh, the two tools. They stood it all up and then went, there you go. 
you, you can have it now. We've, we've done that for you. And because they could do that all piecemeal themselves, they were so much more involved. It became their thing. It wasn't a security thing anymore. It was theirs. We just happened to be the ones that were paying for it and running it afterwards. Um, and it, it, it just worked. So that was great. We've now got some tooling. We've now got developers actually caring about um, um, writing more secure software. They don't. They they think they're writing um, higher quality software. We think it's more secure. Every, everybody's winning. We then start working with the testers, and they they they're really engaged about it. They're loving this because you know the first things that the testers look at are the code quality, the results, and it's like we need to understand more. You know, we, we spend our life writing tests. Can't can't we write tests for this security stuff? It's like. Hell yeah, of course you can. You know, it's, so it's like, well, you know, teach us all your magical ways. Teach us all, you know, teach us all the, the, the complex ways of writing tests. It's like, ain't that complex. You can test for most of this, you know, especially with source access. You can test for a lot of this stuff really easily. Um, you know, obviously there was the initial thing that it, we tried it. You will learn security. And they went, nah, bro, too hard. Um, when it turned into, can you help us with this? And we were like, sure. And it became this constant feedback cycle of they wanted to learn, so we helped. They learned a bit more, we helped them. And bit by bit, it got untangled. Um, are we doing for time? I, that's right. I think we're doing okay. Um, we started to feedback a lot of our day. Try to personally do quite a lot of more offensive stuff. So things like um, the scripts I was writing for perimeter testing with nuclear, I was feeding that back into our testing channel and go, right, I'm testing this at the perimeter. You know that you could test this at build time so it doesn't become an issue for us up. Similar with the bug bounty reports. The bug bounty program started like most places, a big triage thing that um, reports that come in, we go back to the dev or info team looking at the fix and go, hey guys, you screwed up, go fix that. And that'll be the end of it. Whereas now we get those bug bounty reports and go, oh, really interesting. Hey, testers. Somehow this made it past you. You might want to learn from this because you might be able to test for this further up the pipeline. So we were actually using those bug bounty reports not just as a triage thing to fix the problems. We were using them with the testers so that the, the, the testers were testing for them well before, you know, before they'd even made it out of dev environments. Um, we also did a load of fun stuff. Um, we, the, the, I enjoy putting together internal training. We've done a few CTFs. I love building CTFs. I wish I had more time for it. A few people at our community even came along for the ride and now play hack the box with and stuff like that. So we, we've got a whole bunch of people now that are actually, that have gone from the, you know, security is too hard and it's security's job to spending their evenings playing CTFs. And it's like, haha, yes, suckers. <laughs> um, so, um, my God, it really is weird presenting somebody else's slides. So, oh yeah, is pen testing dead? So with this, you could think, hey, Glenn, didn't you just save a million pounds on pen testing here because you, you're now doing all your, you've got your own in, internal staff. No, our pen test spend didn't actually change a penny. However, what we pen tested changed massively. In the early days before we did all this, some little team, little three-person team would write some microservice or some API or some little tiny cog and thing. And we'd throw it over to a, a pen testing team and give them sort of a two or three day engagement, little tiny thing that every pen tester hates because you know, by the time there's, there's really nothing there to get the teeth into. And we'd do that over and over and over again. We don't do any of that anymore. We do very little of that anymore because it's not really that important. We know that that's getting tested part of the pipeline. What we can now do is take that same spend and go, right, this collection of 50 things over here that make up this mega service, so say you know, our, our Sky Vegas service, go test all that. Big open scope, have some free credit on our, our websites, go nuts, try and w whatever you can. Here's all the docs, here's all the source. So we can now give like huge month long, really in depth engagements to pen testers that pen testers seem to actually really love when you give them a wide scope and huge amounts of time to play at it. So it didn't change how much pen testing we did, but it did change how we spent that time. And again, we got so much more value out of that. Putting it all together. Um, all right, yeah, okay. Um, the final bit we did this was more with the project and um, delivery teams. We sat down with them and tried to explain where we'd gone and we said, sort of said, right, you, you can help here because you, you understand products, you understand how we get this stuff live. 
To help your testers and help your devs, what you need to be asking at the beginning of a project is what could possibly go wrong? I mean, yeah, yeah, we, we do that. That's part of what project managers does. That's part of what we do. And then you want to think about you know, what ways could possibly go wrong. So, yeah, we do that. It's like, and then you, what controls can we put over that? It's like, if you can't stop that thing going wrong, if it's an inevitable concept, what controls can we put over it? Be them sort of... Um, uh, di- not direct, detective or, or preventative or, or whatever on that. So okay, we get that. And some people in the room will, will, will be probably already a step, half a step ahead of me. Whilst we didn't teach them stride or anything formal like that, that's just threat modeling. So essentially, we, we've managed to get security testing moved down. We've got secure development moved down. We've got product managers doing threat modeling on the way down. Um, and it's suddenly it's like we've all, you know, all this stuff is moving, um, moving left very rapidly. Um, and suddenly we, we've got entire teams engaged. Back when I used to do that, that BSO role, that front facing role, I may have, you know, a tribe of say 200 people. I may have one security contact tacked in there. Suddenly now a squad of like 10 or 15 people, all 15 people are coming into my meeting because it's like, well, that bit's relevant to me, that bit's relevant. And suddenly they get that security is all their job, not just that one guy that isn't scared of talking about security. Um, compliance is something I've not really talked about. And again, this all came part of it because um, th- there's another talk that a colleague of mine, Lee Hall, did recently, and there's a great blog piece on it, on how we use the... Um, how a house a company, we, we put out lots of repeatable patterns. So we say to dev teams, you can build stuff anywhere you want. You, we, we don't care how you build it, we don't care what you do it. These are the requirements that we've, we've got to come out of it. However, we've already been through all this. This, this thing over here, this team's already done. They, they've, they've done this. If you want to follow their pattern, great. Because they've been through all these questions. They've built this thing that way. That means you get all the compliance stuff for free because we know that it's handled the auth properly. We know that it's handled the um, logging and monitoring properly. So all these compliance tech, tech lists, you can ignore them because you're inheriting their solution. Um, and we kind of bake that into this in so much that it's if it's been gone through a team that's pr- pr- properly adopted this, it's like that's like fast tracks it to becoming a, a, a pattern very much. Um, and we've talked about the fact that, yeah, the testers were building their own testing scenarios. For they, to them, they were just functional tests and unit tests. To us, they were security tests. They were actually designing them off the back of this threat modeling. The sort of stuff that we could only have dreamed that we had time to do as security people. They, they'd already nailed it before we'd even got there. Um, you know, they, they'd started running simulation rigs. They started, you know, they, they, they've built these really complicated load testing things because, like I guess, said to us, uptime is, is everything. Our um, traffic is very, very spiky. You know, three o'clock on a Saturday is huge. Three o'clock in the morning is, is virtually nothing. So they they built all these great tools for pushing huge amounts of data. And it's like, oh, can we start pushing this data through there? Through that, you know, can we can we start pushing potential SQL injection data through there? Can we start pushing XSS through that? So fill your boots. You know, you built all this testing rig. You can it's your service, sure, whatever you want. But it was more they were asking the questions. They were using all this tech they'd already built for uptime testing and starting throwing security tests in it because it, it suddenly dawned on them, why don't we do this? Um, and the various types of testing came together. Um, and again, as I mentioned last time, pen, pen testing contributed but in a different way because we were testing big and a lot more. And again, we were sharing the pen test results not just with the dev team you know, and going, hey, you screwed up over here fix that, or the infra team, and so much so, oh, you, know, you, you, you forgot to configure that server, right? We were sharing it with the full team and going, these are our findings, these are the things that you had the chance to learn, you know, to, to spot on the way up and didn't, so do you want to actually, um, you know, do, do you want to learn from this, and then we can build some of these findings into your stuff, and they did, and it was great. Um, last minute addition to the slide. Um, when I first pitched this talk on sort of Twitter and LinkedIn and stuff, it was designed to be entirely tool agnostic. You'll not, not really mention the tools at all, but people kept pestering me and say, oh, you know, what tools are you using? What have you got? How does it stand up to this? How does it stand up to that? Well, there you go. If you want to see, I'll make the deck available later. That is the, the tool set that we're using. But realistically, this talk is not about those tools. I've only put that in there because I promised people I would. The tools aren't important. You could swap any of those tools out for things that work better for your team. And there will be things that work better for your teams. There will be things that are actually better for you 
than these tools in there. Use them. It's all about finding the right tools for you. That just so happened for the shape of company that we are. That's what we went with. Um, 30 minutes, we're doing fine on time as well. Full circle and um, some unexpected wins. Treating it with the same, we, we trolled this like a It was never meant to be a delivery project this year. It was a journey. It was a can we take this from doing this over here to doing it better by the time we get to there? The analogy I used in a management meeting the other day was it's like we, we've been that parent. We've been spending ages. We've, we've got our kid on the bike. They've been pedaling. We've been holding on to the seat. And we're now just at that point where we've let them go. It's not that we're never going to go anywhere near the bike and consider bike a tick list that our kid can now do. But they're there. They're pedaling on their own. They're going. They're, they're, they, they've got it um, as their thing now. And it has had some really unexpected things. Things like the um, like um, Sonar Cube and Snick that we use in the pipeline now. We'd only ever meant these as passive tools. We'd, we'd meant these as um, reporting tools so that the, um, developers and testers could get an idea of sort of what we call bad code smells, of, of areas to look in. We know that the way these tools work, they're not, it's, it's not like um, front-facing vulnerability management. It's not a case of, oh, you've got a severity, you know, high severity thing, go fix it. Because it might be, oh, you've got a high severity thing that's only an issue if you're allowing arbitrary u user data in there, and we never do that in this component. It's a lot more situational. So we'd never, ever intended to gatekeep based on that data. However, the tribes are starting to do that now. They're coming to us and going, you know, in Sony Cube, if something comes out with like severity or high severity stuff on there, can you actually block it so somebody senior has to check it over before they push it? It's like, we can. We never asked for that. We, we, we as security have never said that we should do that. However, if you think for that project, back out, go for it. Suddenly they've got to the point where they want to actually block themselves because they've got their, their, uh, so much faith in this. Um, the whole collaborative thing has been has been great because we now work so much closer together in so much that they'll come to us with a problem and go, we've got this problem, we think we've got four-fifths of this sorted. What are your thoughts on the rest of it? And we go, all right, you're, yeah, our thoughts on that bit are there. And then it'll, it's a much more collaborative thing now where we're solving each other's problems. Um, the fact that we adopted their ways of working, the fact that we started thinking like a product delivery team means that um, things now just work. It's like they, um, things happen by default because we fit into their way of working rather than being the security policeman that went, no, stop doing it our way because we know what we're doing. We're the smart guys in the room. Um, and it, it, it's having knock-on effects all over the business. Um, we're seeing sort of teams that were even initially involved with this going, hey, we, we saw what we did over there. We're going to in introduce this in this thing over here. Are you down with that? It's like, you're saying that this thing over here, you, you want, you're asking our permission to do better security on it. Well, fill your boots. Um, so it, it kind of, it bought in right across the business. Um, so, on 35 minutes, which is a little bit faster than I'd intended. The closing line for this, the, the actual real thing for this is we had Stefan on board. What Stefan did because of his previous life developer, listened to his colleagues, and rather than being like a security person sat in their little dark security office going, we are the smart people, we will tell you how all to do security, he actually went out and went, no, you're developers. What can security do to help you? How can we make you better at your job? It was them that taught us how to do this. We just fed back in some requirements and how it worked and how we do it and a little bit in there. That was a little bit faster than I, expe I expected. I probably missed loads and loads and loads of good points that Stefan wanted to make in his stuff. Um, I will encourage him to write a blog or something like this on the back of this because say this was his talk. I, I'm, I am that horrible manager that coasts along on his staff's great work. Um, and yeah, it's just really, really unfortunate. He can't be with us to, um, today to present this himself. Um, I'm around on Twitter and most social platforms. Feel free to nudge me and put you up with any questions. But now for the room, any questions? Yes. And I will try and remember to repeat. Oh, you've got a mic. I don't need to repeat the questions. Brilliant. Okay. Um, you briefly mentioned threat modeling. Yes. Were you, 
Are you using that for like design and architecture review or for test planning or yes, multiple we, things? For bigger, wider projects, we do have a, a specific security architecture team that go and engage outside of that loop. So we do actually, for if, if, if somebody was building a big thing, then yes, yeah, security architects get involved. They do do proper threat modeling. Same with the, that BSO team. They still do a level of that. It was more that we'd accidentally taught the um, product managers in the team how to threat. We hadn't even realized we were doing it. It wasn't a, you know, we didn't have a secret list of things we needed to teach them. It's like, all right, taught them, taught them threat modeling. It was a pure accident when they, they showed us how they were looking at these problems and it's like that's literally threat modeling okay it's not stride but it, it it's all those same steps but yes we we do use that for bigger stuff i just we, just outside mine and stefan's little world yeah i think that's back to your gatekeeping bullshit thing yeah. it's like i read about threat modeling when i was a developer but thought of it's just like some process not a skill yeah uh, absolutely that. And don't, don't get me wrong, I, I am a big fan of Stride. I'm even a big fan of Stride itself. I, it's useful. But if you just go and throw it at a developer and go, right, we're going to go through this, it looks like 16 layers of bullshit. It really does. You can say, bringing it in through stealth like that or just... what I When I was in that beta role, what I used to do for that was I'd sit in a room with them and ask them lots of questions. You know, what's the worst thing you can imagine happening? What about this control over here? What keeps you up at night? And then I go away and it's sort of on my own without the developer in the room, try and retrofit that into a, a, a threat model framework. Anything else? Anyone? Oh, sorry. I let the guy with the mic decide who's speaking next. I think it's the lady in front, the row in front. I mean, just pick random people in the audience. That'd be quite fun. Just, yeah. <laughs> um, really good talk. Enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering from like a security testing, um, code QA tooling perspective, did you find that that was more effective in teaching engineers kind of secure development practices than typical secure dev training, um, OWASP top 10? Was it more efficient or would you recommend doing both for a good AppSec program? I, I think it depends. It literally was down to the individual what worked for them. We, we, we've tried different ways. For us, our sort of CPT based computer training really isn't very good. We knew it wasn't very good. We talked to lots of organizations, one of which is actually out there today about using their tooling to make it good. And we've mixed and matched it. You know, I, I, I've done one to one sessions. I, we, I say we, we've, we've done the whole gamified thing. Some of it works for some people, some of it doesn't. Some people just immediately, when they said, oh, we can now do security testing, went out and got the, um, what's the web app? The big tome, the um, web app hackers handbook, and literally devoured that because it's like, I've got a new thing I can learn. It really changed from person to person. So I, I don't think there is any one right way. And I think in an organization our side, the, the, you, you, you literally have to go, there you go. There's a, there's a destination we need to get to. Here's a few different ways we're going to try. Whatever, whatever works. And yeah, basically anyone improving themselves, I'll take. I see spot Hannah. You're going to have to go back to the person you nearly bullied into um, speaking when she didn't have a question. <laughs> um, so for your um, automated testing pipeline, um, do all the devs get involved with that? Like if one of them wants to try out a new type of testing, would you let them set it up themselves, or are there two different teams to do that? It, it varies. Our entire company ethos is based on sort of autonomy all the way down. So, at a, a, as a, each team can basically do their own thing, and that goes right through the company. So, at a, a philosophical level, absolutely, our, our company, we're going to go away, experiment, go, go, um, Go play, go learn yourself. One of the reasons that we have like 160 separate VPCs in AWS is that we encourage you know, just go play. Individual teams may have their own processes, their own things. I, I would hope that our CTAP team, the, the people that deal with the money and the finance and the really important, uh, not the finance, so the actual transactional taking money off people's stuff. I would, end, I would really hope they weren't just going and I would have tried something different with live credit. In production, I'm really hoping that they that, that there'll be a little bit more gateway with that. But no, as a company, we're very big on just try it. If it doesn't work, go try something else. Thank you. There was other hands there. I don't know why I'm pointing. You can't see. <laughs>
Nice talk, Glenn. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, so you talked about a little bit uh, how you brought your teams in line with the process, right? Yeah. Uh, but everyone has an opinion, yeah? Yeah. So how do you align your C-level, your CTO, your head of software to understand the security are trying to drive quality, not only security requirements, yeah? <laughs> the reason I'm giggling at that is that in an early preparation for this, Stefan tried to explain this, because th this has literally been his last two years. I tried to explain it to our, um, our CISO a few weeks ago, and I kind of went to the CISO after some feedback. He went, yeah, he blew my mind. He's a monstrously clever guy, but I don't get any of it. It's like, great, wait until I've done the B-Sides talk, because hopefully that'll like, you we know, can watch the video version. Hopefully that makes a bit more sense. So Sean, if you're watching, hopefully that now explains what Stefan's been doing for the last two years. Um, but no, it's, it's very hard. And that's partly why me and Stefan work so well together in so much that we're both from an engineering, engineering background. We're both, um, you know, sort of techies at heart. However, he's very good at strategy and doing and, and, and the big picture. I'm very good at saying the right words to the right people to land ideas. So, uh, in, in answer to how do we sort of land that message from everyone down to, from engineers through to CISO and the CTO and stuff like that is me. <laughs> I don't mean that as a big, no, it's literally that is part of my job is to try and interpret his galaxy brain stuff into dilutable parts for people. But it, it, it is hard. I mean, literally, we, you have to sort of explain it in a different way at every level. I, I couldn't, there's no magic, oh, we explained it like this and everyone got it. It's like, no, I've, expl I've done equivalents of this talk in about 10 different ways, focused on different things. And ultimately, it still boils down to about three sentences in the end, in so much that we let devs and testers do their own thing to get what we wanted because we're people hackers at the end of the day. Anybody else? Show them Can you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Of course. Uh can you comment on the onboarding experience for, so let's say, an imaginary scenario, I'm a new development team, I want to write some microservices on your AWS accounts. The thing I noticed is there you have an infra team, a security team, different teams on a different bunch of tooling. How is the onboarding experience? Are the teams just like ordering through some self-service portal everything, or is it like a lot of governance checks? How do I learn to use? Snake correctly. How does like my experience as a dev on day one look like? Again, that that varies massively from team to team. And if we were trying to, if if we'd have just got to this point today, and it's like there it is, go. We'd probably do it very differently. This has actually been a building experience where we can go where where we've gone out to key influences in the company and gone. We're doing this thing. Can you help this land? You know, land this with your product managers, with your test leads. We, we actually use quite a network of people to try and work out how to um, sort of onboard them through that thing. Um, the, so if we were doing it today, actually, it probably would be very different. We, we would go for something much more, I don't want to say prescriptive, but um, where, where it could be a click and go onboarding. As a company, we're very big on click and board, you know, click and go, here's access to your tool thing. Um, for the, for the two particular, if we're talking specifically about the, the technical tools we've used, we have automated that quite a lot. The, um, literally, we, we built them both into our internal um, IAM and identity system, so a developer can just go, hey, I want, you know, I'm working on this repo over here. I want to use Snick on it, and sort of a, a dozen different people get a request, and we all go, yeah, you know, why would we ever say no to that request? Click the button, and away they go. So there, there is a little bit of gating around that process, but it's ultimately we, it's more about making sure that people have access to their data within the tooling rather than whether they can use the tool. You know, basically, it, it stops some sort of junior in marketing going, oh, I want access to all your credit card payment um, you know, pro um, vulnerability of so in the case of Nick, all the dependency problems or all the code reviews, stuff like that. It's like, well, there's, there's a bit of gating in there. I, but no. Um, in terms of that, though, it's mostly, it's mostly self-serve. Most of the developers can just go and click in that they want access, and it just magically... Again, Stefan's genius, uh, galaxy brain stuff. I have absolutely no idea how any of that actually works. I just know that they go click a thing in one identity, and suddenly 
they have access and it goes away. And literally the only real support we get off the back of that is I get a lot of managers moaning at me. It's like, you know, um, you know, we, we requested access on Thursday. It's m- now Monday and we haven't got it. It's like, you're a development team and you're complaining that I, you can't have access to security tools after three days. It's like, no, you know, a year ago, you wouldn't come and talk to us. Now you're complaining that we can't give you tools to do this quick. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, did, did that answer your question? That was a, a lot of skirting around the edge without actually answering any of it. Okay, I think that's all the time we've oh. got. Oh, we've got one more question. I forgot. Oh, no, that. just Tom, no, he doesn't get to speak because this, this is going to be a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of aligning security into code quality, yep. did you find that existing metrics, the metrics that the dev teams were already using to measure code quality, did they need modifying to include security? And, and a secondary question, did you see a measured improvement in code quality? Yes and yes, but only because they chose the tooling. If we'd have gone with the tooling we would have got, they wouldn't have got that same comparative um, quality score. You know, they'd have got like new tool, new score, and it would have it would have been much harder to measure. The fact that they'd already built existing tooling to spot what they considered poor coding practices, and now they've just used that to include security as what can be covered, it made it very, very easy. But again, from security point of view, we didn't want to actually impact on that. We collect that data, but we don't publish it. We, you know, with vulnerability scores and stuff like that, we actually publish that data across the country for people to see. With the code quality stuff, we absolutely don't because we feel that that is the tribe's own data. It's like they're, you're working with this to improve your stuff. We don't care. Like, if you're getting happier and we're getting less problems further up the pipeline, we don't really care how much of a mess you're making down here as long as by the time it gets to live, it's all good. So, um, can I see a marked improvement? I absolutely don't know at the code quality stage, but I can see a marked improvement at the vulnerability management stage, so we know it's working. Well, we know something between these two is working, and I'm guessing it's all this stuff, because it makes sense. And I do apologize for running over 47 It's okay, minutes, so. no problem. Well, we'd like to, that's a great talk, Glenn. If we'd like to put your hands together for Glenn, that's great. <laughs>